action. That's God doing what God does. Because what happens when you start mystifying things, we, we got to be careful. We, we're, we can get into idol worship real easy. Whether it be individuals, It can be preachers. Every one of us got a little preacher religion in us. Me included. If I heard Wayne Huntley was going to be in Houston, I'd be there. That's one of my favorite preachers. I mean, he, he always makes me repent. And any preacher makes me repent, I want to go hear him. Amen. I promise this... Church, fan, if I said Robert Bear is going to be in Katy, some of y'all would skip out on me. Oh, Brother Bumgarner, I had to go to the mall. <laughs> and since we were over here, we decided to go to church. Just tell me the truth. You want to go here, Brother Bear? Because I'll probably be sitting on the third row. We dismissing tonight. Brother Bear is going to be in Katy. <laughs> get on the van. Get on the bus. <laughs> but you know, we got to be careful because we, people make objects. We mystify objects. Even to this day, people are mystifying the tabernacle and the temple. And we know that there's signs to come. They're going to rebuild the temple. And they're fixing to lay the cornerstone for the new temple. And that's all in scripture and prophecy. But you know, uh, it's just a building. We know where the Spirit of God dwells now. But we, we got to be careful that people don't allow us because they'll, they'll quote things and they'll bring in sources from here and there. And this and that. And in fact, you know, uh, let's just be truthful. And, and I'm just building a foundation tonight. That's my only goal tonight is to build a foundation to where we're going to go. But the thing is, is people oftentimes will say, well, I don't do this or I don't do that. That's pagan. But my question to them is, are you pagan? Now, I don't believe in worshiping bunnies. And I know that Santa Claus ain't real. But I had one elder teach me this. That for your children, the thing about fairy tales and why we tell them to our children, and they lived happily ever after, is because for the children to believe the unbelievable, we put these stories in their lives jack and the beanstalk i mean you ever heard that story as a kid that was one of my favorites fee five fo fum huh and so i don't believe i don't worship santa claus i know that december 25th isn't jesus's birthday I know the word Christmas is Latin for service to Christ. And we use it to honor Jesus for his birthday. It's a great time of the year to tell the story of the birth of Jesus. Two times a year people come to church for whatever reason. Christmas and Easter. I use Easter as a time to tell the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a powerful story. It's a powerful time of year. I don't tap into their, the beginnings of the paganism. Hello? Now, there are some who don't like Christmas trees. I like Christmas trees. I always had a Christmas tree. Okay? I'm not telling you to get a Christmas tree. I don't worship the Christmas tree. But at the same time, we take the scripture out of Jeremiah where it talks about them going into a grove. And if you're going to use that scripture then make sure you make the idol Ashtardi, who was the guard of fertility that they always put in front of the other temples. They would carve her out in a nude image. Okay? Now that's what that's talking about. But we get caught up in mysticism. And we start saying, well, this is vile and that's vile. I don't even know why I'm going down this path and I'm walking it, Okay? Because I want us to be rooted and grounded in truth. Paul talks about, you know, some call this evil or that evil. You've got to be careful of what you're demonizing. Okay? Whatever you're 
traditions are around that time of year, that's fine. And I respect those things. Okay? Now, I've been in the church for 40-something years. I've been raised around all my life. And every Christmas, my family had a Christmas tree. And we would have family get together. And we eat turkey. And we eat ham. And we eat chocolate pie. And we tell the story of the birth of Jesus. And we give gifts because the Father above who gives perfect gifts gave us the gift of the only begotten of the Son. And because He loved us, He gave gifts. And because we love each other, we give gifts. Amen? And we, you know, as a family, we don't really get caught up in, in the Santa Claus. But even Santa Claus has a story that if you'll study it, you'll see the good in it. When you begin to study who Nicholas was and how he gave his wealth away to give to the poor in Greece. I mean, so we can easily demonize these things. We can. But here, here's the truth of it. If I'm living in a way that is pleasing to God, if I'm doing these things in paganistic worship, it would be one thing if I was diverting these things to paganistic worship. But what I have done is I'm going to take those things and glorify God. And when we do those things and we glorify God and we keep the Lord at the center of whatever you're doing in worship. Hello? Because the thing, the thing is, is, and, and I've got a whole lesson on this I can teach, but I, I don't want to go there. I just want us to make sure we don't get caught up in mysticism and paganism things. Because if you say good Monday to somebody, you've just mentioned a paganistic, paganistic day. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They're all named after paganistic gods. I mean, were we going to become Irish and say... Top of the morning to you. <laughs> you go to the bank and they say put a date on this, you know, or what month is it? You're not going to, you know, you're not going to say, well, I can't write October because it's got a pagan origin. That dates back to the Romanistic calendar and and, uh, you know, that was used to worship the God Jupiter. And so I just use good common sense, folks. In living for God, don't get caught up in all the, the mysticism of things past. And stay rooted in the Word of God. Because there's going to be all kinds of winds of doctrines come. And there's going to be all kinds of things that try to cause you to, to be lost and, and you know, they're going to try to make you think with a mystical perception. Could this really be? And there's a difference between mysticism and faith. Well, help us, Lord. The literalist, when you literally interpret the literal method, does not deny the existence of figurative language. He does, however, deny that such figures must be interpreted so as to destroy the literal truth intended through the use of the figures. Literal truth is to be learned through the symbols. So the types and shadow that are in the Word of God, there's types and shadows all through the Old Testament. And in the weeks ahead, we'll be talking about the, the types and the shadows and, and how they're relevant to, to prophetic prophecy being fulfilled in the New Testament and into the church. But you have to be careful that you don't allow the figurative things to take predominance in an interpretation. The ark was a type of the Spirit of God. And yet, while God dwelt there in the mercy seat, it was a holy vessel. But when His Spirit moved away, it no longer was a holy vessel. It was the Spirit of God that made it holy. 
And so there, there would be those that would say, oh, that's the, that's the symbol. That's the problem with, with Catholicism. The vessel is more holy than the temple. And the statue with, oh, that's holy, or the, or the, the figure of the cross. Well, my Bible told me he come off the cross. <laughs> He's no longer on the cross. So you can wear a symbol of the cross all you want, but that just shows me a place where he died. But he's no longer on the cross. He's no longer in the tomb. He rose again, established himself for who he was, and then he ascended into heaven. Hallelujah. So, you know, we, we get caught up. Well, you know, I, I, I wear this as a symbol of my faith. Why don't you live for God as a symbol of your faith rather than some piece of jewelry? Just a thought. I'm trying to hurry. It should be noted that the literal method of interpretation was used by the New Testament in the interpretation of the Old Testament. The literal method was used up until the time, origin, and other Christian philosophers devised the allegorical method to harmonize to bring platonic philosophy and scripture together it's it, it was allowing there to be this the uh, symbolism to begin to intertwine old testament and new testament and i'm i don't want to i'm not trying to talk over anybody I, I want you to make sure you you understand where where I, i'm i'm going with this today jesus loved to speak in allegories and, and show different symbolisms and different things. And so, you know, it, it, we, we use the interpretation of the literal interpretation, amen, to get an understanding of the Old Testament to see the identity of those things in the New Testament so we can see how they apply to the church in our present. Now, please don't make me say that again because I don't know if I can say it right. But that's the truth. When we interpret literally, there's some rules. All the prophecies of the suffering Messiah were literally fulfilled in the first advent of Christ. We have no reason to believe that the predictions of a glorified and reigning Messiah will be brought to pass in any other manner. And so that, the rules for the interpretation of prophecy first, we're going to interpret literally. So when it talks about he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was born him, and with his stripes we are healed. He has fulfilled that already. Number two, interpret according to the harmony of prophecy. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. In fact, would you put that up there for me, Sister Brandy? First Peter 1 and 20 and 21. Back in the day, Brother Fisher would point over and say, now read for me. So I got Sister Brandy back here. She's, she's going to put it up and we're going to see it. In five, four, three. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in. I'm sorry, I told you first, Peter. Give me second, Peter. See, Brother, Brother Myers, I make mistakes too. That scripture kind of applies though. But let's get into the second Peter 1 and 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost now I teach the concept of red flags it was taught to me so I teach it anybody know what the concept of red flags is 
when someone starts saying, well, my interpretation or, you know, my personal believing of that scripture, talking about any scripture in the word of God, when they start using I, me, mine, or little red flags start going up. Especially when it's a private ideal. So I get red flags. In fact, when I'm talking to people about things that there's no real concrete, I'll say, the school of thought is this. See, I didn't say it was my ideal. Or I just said, here's a school of thought. Because you can have a school of thought on something. That's a theory. And, and you know, there's lots of theories out there. There's ideologies that God gives us. And some things, you know, I, I won't say they're dead. You'll never hear a pastor get up there and say, this is, this is it. Unless I can prove it with at least two or three proofs, then I'm not going to say it's fact. But I will say, could it be, or this school of thought says this, or this individual, or these thought? So there's the ideology of it. But we know this, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of a private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in no time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, we, it has to be in harmony. And you'll know. If you've got your spiritual feelers out, you'll, you'll know, well, that's, you know, prove it. If somebody speaks a theory, you got a red flag, we'll say, prove it to me. In the scripture. And then they start, well, I was reading John C. Maxwell. And Maxwell said, okay, well, you didn't prove it to me in the word of God. What else you got? Well, I, I was reading uh, The Purpose Driven Church, and in the, well, that's another book, but what does it say in the Word of God? And when people start quoting to me books and book sources, those are still just ideals and theories. I read all kinds of books, folks. I love to read. But when, when I read books, you know, I understand that that is somebody's ideology being put down on paper. That's their thought or their theory on a certain thing. And so, you know, I'm going to take the good and I'm just going to chunk out the bad. Amen. So, but I know that the word of God gives me some clear-cut prophecy to live. Okay? It lets me know that how things are going to be. And, and why, why does God give us prophe prophecy? So we can be ready. Now, you know, there are those that... Uh, preach and I have done it when I was younger you know I've gone to the book of Matthew the 24th chapter and and I've talked about the Lord coming again you know wars and rumors of wars look up for your redemption draweth nigh that is not talking about the rapture there are those that will teach that and say that's when you know that's talking about the coming again of the Lord because there's a taking away and then there's a coming again and we'll talk about that we'll get into that but there are those that, you know, they'll preach that as, as biblical prophecy of the coming of, or, or as the rapturing of the church. But when you study it further in Revelation, you know that the church is going to be part of that returning. And I want to be there. Amen? Is, is this, everybody in, okay with this tonight? I know we're going to be teaching, but you know what? I want you to be ready, folks. That's my job as a pastor, is to have the church ready, not, not knowing. I don't want us to be spiritually ambushed. Brother, Brother Bacchus, he really started hitting on some nerves Sunday morning. I mean, he, he, he's telling the truth, folks. We, we, don't put your hopes in this world. Don't put your hopes in the economy of this world. Amen. Observe the perspective of prophecy. Consider events which bear some relationship to one another, such as prophecies concerning the Babylonian captivity, the events of the day of the Lord, the return from Babylon, the dispersion of Israel and their future gathering. There are parts of one, one program. Therefore, a prophecy dealing with one aspect could deal with the whole. And there's a way to look at prophecy, okay? When you're reading the prophets in the Word of God, there, there's ways that you understand prophecy. Prophecy either applied to the day that it was being written, as in the time of the Babylonians. Prophecy was written to be fulfilled in the time of Christ. 
Our prophecy was to be fulfilled in the time of the church, which we are still in the time of the church. Read the book of Acts. The very last chapter of Acts has no amen. Because it's not over yet. And so prophecy is being fulfilled in the church today. And it will continue to be fulfilled until the taking away. Amen. Observe the time relationships. This is particularly true in prophecies concerning Christ where events of the first and second advents are, are spoken of together as though taking place at the same time. The first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord. You, you, you got to look at the time frame that Sometimes they're going to be said, we're going to get into this. And I, I'm just telling you, we're going to take this literal look at the scripture. We're going to make sure we study the time relationships. And then interpret prophecy Christologically. Interpret prophecy. And this is, to me, a very, very important way to look at things. Christologically. And it really is a word, Sister Brandy. Some folks, you just got to check. She's, she's going to be back on the computer looking up. It's Christological world. Remember the central theme of all prophecy. Everybody tell me who the center of it all is. Jesus. All prophecy is focused on the Lord Jesus. All Old Testament prophecy is focusing on Jesus coming into this world to be the Savior of the world. And all the prophecy that is being fulfilled afterward. The, Bi the last book of the Bible is called the Revelation. Not Revelations. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. His person and His work is the grand theme of the whole story. Everything focuses to Calvary. Everything focuses to Jesus. And then everything after Jesus. Mercy followed him to the cross, but grace left with him there. We have to interpret historically the full meaning and significance of all proper names, events, geographical references, references to customs or material cultures, References to even the flora, the fauna, the, the flowers, the animals, the nature of things. We have to make sure that we interpret grammatically. Strict rules that govern grammatical interpretation must be apply, applied to that field of study. That's why anyone who reads Matthew 28, 19 and breaks it down grammatically will see that it is in the name. <laughs> I mean, you can just take it grammatically and break down the sentence. I never... Really enjoyed that. What's the prepositional phrase? I don't know. <laughs> you know, they'd stay after you till you got it. In the house. But you know, we have to make sure that we look at this thing grammatically. Because if we're not careful, you, you don't do it in a proper grammatical connotation it says something altogether differently and I, I don't have time to get on it but there's people that don't use proper uh, commas when they're posting things on and sometimes when they write something um, you know they don't realize what they're saying Interpret according to the law of double reference. A prophecy may have a near view and a far view, and I talked about that. The near view may have been fulfilled, and the far view await fulfillment, or both may be awaiting future fulfillment. And so, that's what I'm talking about. You know, it may have happened in the time that it was being written, especially in the prophets, you know, the near view, or the far view, things yet to come, things to be done in in the times in our future. So we're, we're going to take time to look at the word of God and, and prophecy. And uh, we're, we're just going to take a, a season to literally look at the word of God and how it applies. Now you're not going to hear pastor get up here and say, you know, 
I believe this is this or this is that or I'm not because when people start saying well that's what that means then then you have just interpret that you know without really knowing you say how do you know that pastor because you know I can say you know the dragon is you know Europe or I can say and that's just a thought or a theory and, and the reason I say that is because when I was a kid they would tell stories and Dad loved prophecy, and, I, I, and, and we'd go to these prophecy conferences, and, and they would tell stories about some guy over in the desert that was doing all this stuff, healing the babies, and, you know, and, and he was the Antichrist. Well, 30 years later, and he's not showed up. And then others would say, well, you know, it's the Roman Catholic Church. And there's a whole school of thought on that. But when we start studying this prophecy, I want us to have a true biblical understanding so that when you see the signs of the time, isn't that the most important reason to know prophecy? Prophecy is the study of eschatology. You want to get into a biblical term of it. And that's just the study of prophecy the things to come do I believe in prophets absolutely Bible says there's a five-fold ministry there's pastors evangelists teachers apostles missionaries and prophets men like brother Palmer I have no doubt I would call him a prophet he operates in the gift of prophecy near prophecy he comes in here, God helps him. And he was able to prophesy to people's lives. You know, here's what God's going to do for you. So I do believe in prophets. However, we, we make sure in the study of prophecy, end time prophecies, things that are going to affect the world. I, I just want to challenge the church. Be careful uh, of the things that are out there. People are forming forming doctrines and followings based on their own theories of end time prophecy. The first thing you need to understand in, 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 in studying prophecy is the covenants. And then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build this and then I'm going to dismiss. But the biblical covenants contained in the scriptures are of primary importance into the interpreter of the word and to students of eschatology, study of prophecy. God's program, or eschatological program, is determined and prescribed by these covenants. And your prophecy system is determined and limited. See, people don't like to put limits on prophecy. That's where mysticism comes in. But when you keep it in the word of God and you base it upon the covenants, then you know that there is limits to the interpretation of what the Bible is saying in reference to prophecy. And so the first things we're going to study are the different covenants. These covenants must be studied so we will have an understanding of how they apply into prophecy. There are two kinds of covenants into which God entered with Israel. Conditional and unconditional. The conditional covenant was one in which its fulfillment depended upon the recipient of the covenant. Not upon the one making the covenant. It is a covenant with an if attached to it. The Mosaic covenant made by God with Israel is such a covenant. Yet in an unconditional covenant... The fulfillment depends on the one making the covenant. There is no if attached. So you're going to have, we're going to study covenants that were based on condition. And yet there are covenants that don't have condition. In fact, because it's so good, I, I don't want to just rush this. And I hope that you're understanding that tonight. 
And I don't want to wear you out because I know this is a lot of information, you know, and I don't want to wear you out trying to just load it. But we're going to start talking about covenants next week. We're going to get into Abraham's covenant. And Abraham's covenant is essential in all the other covenants. Abraham's covenant, amen, literally, uh, and I'll have this up for you to see next week, but Abraham's covenant feeds into the three areas of the other covenants, the land, sea, and the blessing. And it deals with the, there's the Abrahamic, Abraham, Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. We'll get into all of those, but it all starts back with Abraham. His unconditional covenant between him and God. And even though we're in the church dispensation, and there are those that would say that Israel doesn't matter anymore and that God doesn't care about Israel. That's a falsehood. There's a school of thought that wants to say that there are no Jews any longer, that Israel does no longer have any true Jews, that they're all part of the European Jews that come from... But that's false. That's false doctrine. That's false teaching. God made a covenant with Abraham. And for, for me to wrap this up, I'm just going to put it like this. God made a covenant with Abraham that his seed would multiply like the sands and like the stars. And they've had their times of transgression. And they've had to pay for their bad decisions. And they have had to shed blood, you know, because they wanted his blood. But that is all a fulfilling of the word of God. Amen? And yet there's this one unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham for him and his seed for generations to come until the end of time. We know that God gives us a dispensation of grace for us who are mostly all Gentiles. But there will be a day when the church is caught away. That dispensation of grace will end and God will turn back to Israel. It's not based off of a love. Now, let me just uh, clarify something. Not just because he loves them, okay? It's because he made a covenant with Abraham. He made a contract. And so, Abraham, I've got some time where I'm going to turn back, turn away, give these Gentiles the opportunity to fulfill my spirit. The Jews can fill my spirit. Anybody who wants to fill my spirit. That's why he said it, the Holy Ghost was poured out first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. God's a God of order. First, I'm going to give it to my promise, the Jews, then the Judeans. Then I'm going to go to the Samaritans, which are half Jews, half Gentiles. And then I'll give it to the Gentiles. And when you read the book of Acts, how did it happen? Jews, Judeans, Samaritans, Gentiles. So when the Lord comes back, he's going back to that Abraham, that covenant. That new covenant includes the church, but the Abraham covenant will be back in place. God will fulfill what he promised Abraham. So, with that being said, next week we're going to start getting into the covenants. I'll be able to tell you every week what we're going to get into. Next week we're going to start talking about the covenants. So if you want to go home this week and if you want to start studying the covenants, you'll come with a notepad. I'm telling you folks, if, if this interests you, bring your pad, bring your paper, bring your Bibles. Let's get into the Word of God. Let's have a good literal understanding of prophecy where we're at. So we'll know and not have to be a word or be afraid. Amen. I'm going home with Jesus. Amen. Prophecy doesn't scare me. But it sure keeps me aware of things. And when anything's happening with Israel, I wake up and pay attention. Because I know the Lord is going to come for a church of the treaty be raptured away because someday he's going to come back to his people he's going to have a host with him and I want to be one of them Amen. can we stand to our feet tonight
Lord Jesus, I thank you for understanding. And I pray, Lord, that in our learning this week, next week and the weeks to come, that we'll do so with an open mind and an open spirit and with understanding. I'm trusting in you, Lord, that this will not breed fear, but, Lord, it will allow us to make sure that we are ready. And that, Lord, we've done what we're supposed to do to be prepared to meet you some glorious day. For, Lord, I believe that your word is coming to pass quicker now than it has ever come to pass. And I pray, God, that you would help me as I teach, help the church to understand as we continue to grow through the prophetic word in Jesus' name. Can the church say amen? Amen. Let's invite amen, worshiping the Lord. My, did we not have a time this weekend. We went to the homegoing service memorial today of Brother Tommy Taylor and uh, Samuel Thomas Taylor, also known as Tex. We found that out today. Many of you may know him or have heard of him. He was the one responsible for winning uh, Brother Staines to the Lord. And... Uh, he has gone on to his reward, and he battled cancer for a short time, but then he made heaven his home. Amen. He was a faithful man of, in Brookshire, Texas for the last, uh, I believe it was 24 to 28 years, pastoring Brookshire Tabernacle there in that city. And uh, one of my very first revival services uh, when I was evangelizing back in 1994 was preached right there. It was in an old bank building right there downtown Brookshire and uh, the vault was the prayer room I remember asking him what happens if there's something that that door shuts and locks he says you better know how to pray I'll never forget he was just getting the church started he told me he said brother I can't pay you very much for preaching but if you're willing to work I can take care of you real good being a welder's helper I said, I'll work as a welder's helper, you know, I'm, I've been one before, and, and uh, so he and I went out on a job and, and uh, got on top of a tank. That was my first time of ever getting on top of one of them tanks. And I looked across the way, and the top of one of the tanks was missing. And uh, I, I said, well, what happened over there? He said, well, there was a welder about a year ago, went over there and forgot to check to see if there was anything in the tank, and he lit the torch, and and it blew him to bits. And, and uh, while he was telling me that, he's sitting there striking uh, a flicker to, to light his torch. And, and I said, have we checked the tank? He said, oh, I don't worry about it. If the Lord blows us away, we're ready to go. I'm like, you better check the tank. I'm getting off this. Thing. You crazy. He was a great man. And uh, he had a tremendous sense of humor. In fact... One of the men, his brother-in-law, who's a pastor, told a story about him and Brother Taylor going surfing. They went to a, they went down to a private part of the beach. He said, you know, for our privacy and the people's protection. If you need to figure that one out, I'll tell you after service. But he said Brother Taylor was always pushing the edge, and, and uh, he said I went out a little ways and I started surfing back in, but he went way out. He said, all of a sudden, I turned around, and he was getting with it with everything he had in him, and he was getting back to shore quick. And he said, I asked him, what was, what's, what's the matter? He said, shark. He and I are like faith. You get in that water, there's sharks. But some people, they just don't bother, but other people, they do. Well, aren't you glad to be living for the Lord today? Aren't you glad to know that Jesus cares about you enough to save you because we're not living for this world if you're living for this world then you you got your priorities messed up this world has nothing to offer you I mean whether the Texans win a football game or not they're not going to give you a piece of their paycheck It's not going to do anything for you. You know, I'm, I'm as human as anybody. When local people 
do great things. I get excited. I think that's fun, you know. But you know what? They're not going to save my soul. No star in Hollywood is going to save your soul. I don't care how good looking they are. Come on, we base everything off of appearance. There's an old man in my hometown, you know. He was talking about that one time. I don't know why I'm going there, but, but you know, he says, you know, I got more money on the surface than some of these people who act like they've got hidden. You know, people can put up appearances pretty good. One of my, uh, my wife's uh, good friends and, and doctors, she's worked for him before. He, he's from South Africa, and uh, he, uh, he's practiced up in the woodlands for years. He's got a practice there, him and his wife. They're both optometrists. And, and uh, he says, you know, people come in here all the time, and, and they look like they're successful. He says, but when a platinum credit card gets denied because you're overdrawn. In, in fact, he, he, he worked over in Pasadena for a while at a place, and, and uh, it was cash only. He said, man, I, I loved it. He said, they come in, they didn't have no problem. They'd pull it out and lay it down and go on about their business. There's no facade. That was the real deal. But a lot of times people live behind facades. In fact, you know, I've said it before, Facebook really is just a facade. You know, everybody's smiling, everybody's getting along. And one day everybody's smiling, getting along. Next day, you know, somebody's got marital problems. Well, wait a second, I just saw you on Facebook. So a lot of times we live behind facades. And, you know, the world, sometimes the things that we get involved with, it's just to block things out of our mind to try to get a... You know, to make us feel like everything's okay. But we're living in a time, in a day, in an age where we better know what we know. I heard something from a preacher today. And, uh, you know, he, he said it's a shame that anybody could come into a church with a gun and shoot people. And the people in that church not have enough spiritual discernment to know that evil was in the house. But if we're constantly saturating ourselves with the spirits of the world out there, and we're comfortable with them out there, then when we come in here and they're here, we won't know the difference. You know, we need to be prayed up to know when an evil spirit steps into the room. We need to have spiritual discernment. Amen. We ought to have enough of the Holy Ghost in us to know that when somebody steps in here that needs a good praying through, we'd be sent enough in the Holy Ghost to be able to pray against that spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, when I was teaching on altar work, and I, was, I talk about building a hedge around somebody and creating an atmosphere of worship and praise. Amen? Not so much speaking at that person all the time when they're praying. Amen? They may not need to hear you speaking into their ear. But they may be battling some spirit on the inside, and what they really need for you to do is to pray that whatever they're battling, they can overcome. Amen. So we got to use wisdom. We're living in a day and age where people are, you know, want to blame, blame the guns. And that's like, I read something else that said, you know, that's like making people that are sober not be able to drive cars because of drunk drivers. We're going to outlaw cars because drunk drivers kill people in cars. When we all know it's really a heart issue. Because all sin comes down to an all heart issue. I mean, with Cain and Abel, it was a heart issue. As far back as you go, sin has always been a heart issue. You're either living in obedience with the Word of God or you're living in rebellion to the Word of God. Amen. 
And that's where we find ourselves today. I want the church to, to be aware of that. And I'm going to, over the next several weeks, probably into the very end of the year, just be teaching along the lines of prophecy. The, not so much the end time, but just an understanding of prophecy. Amen? So Wednesday nights can, are going to get very interesting. But the first thing that I, I want us to understand is that we can't get caught up in, you know, a spirit of the day. Now, I've been in the church over 40 years, and I have seen a lot of things come and go in my youthful 40 years. Amen. I can remember in 1988, there was 88 reasons that the Lord was going to come back. And then I remember in the year 2000, everybody was saying the rapture was going to take place before 2000. And some folks were storing up, you know, Vienna sausages and... Or as Brother Fisher said, Vienna. Vienna, or however he said it. Vienna. Vienna sausages. You know, bottles of water. People in those companies were smiling. You know, people had their surplus of spam. Military rations. Ammo. All the computer systems in the world were going to crash. Because they weren't sure if the computer systems were going to be able to roll over. People were flooding our churches. They were worried about the end time coming. And then in 2001, on 9-11, things got close to home. People lost their lives, and, and then, then people started getting concerned. They were coming to churches and praying, because in their mindset, okay, this is the end. And things don't really bother you till they're close at home. And yet, over in the Middle East right now, there are those that are Christians or, you know, that are getting their heads chopped off. There are those in China living in hiding because, you know, if they get caught worshiping the Lord, in fact, when the Holy Ghost comes on them, others have to go. Here's how they, how, how, how they do altar working over in China. When the Holy Ghost starts moving on you and you're about to break out in tongues, one of the brothers or sisters in the church has to go over and, cover your mouth while you're getting your blessing hopefully very soon I can introduce y'all to brother Kong he's a fascinating man but he'll let you know you know it's one thing when a brother and sister are, are shouting together because the Holy Ghost is moving on you but if you let a noise out and you get heard it may cost you your life so folks we, 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 we get lulled to sleep Because the economy's pretty good. I mean, politicians can gripe about it all day long. And, and, and especially here in Texas, we're blessed. We're blessed. They said, you know, if you've got a roof over your head, clothes in your closet, food on your table, you're, more, you're wealthier than 75% of the people in the world. Brother Shrek Ice was telling me that the average salary a day is $5 a day in Honduras. He says, they do good on $5 a day. He says, they're politicians, and I think we ought to pay our politicians the same. Their politicians only make $3,000 a month. Now, that's a lot of money for their politicians. I wouldn't mind paying our politicians that. They spend less time in Washington. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we're not... Sometimes in here in the States, we're, we're kind of in a cocoon. That we really don't feel the urgency of the coming of the Lord. Part of Israel's problem in, in times past, and we'll get into that some, was they never felt an urgency. And the only time they called on the Lord was when they were in trouble. You know, let... The Babylonians surround the city and, oh, Lord, we need you to deliver us. 
you know, make us captives. We want to be delivered from captivity. Put us in bondage in Egypt and we want deliverance. But you know, that's a part of the problem with the church today is that there's no sense of urgency. We've led a spirit of apathy. Hello? We've let an apathetic spirit get a hold of us and, and there's no urgency even in reaching the lost. We, we've got to understand that the Lord is, is getting this world ready first for a taking away and then for a reappearing of him in all his glory so let's talk about it we're going to get into to, to prophecy and, and i'm going to be teaching some things and uh, the main method to use in studying prophecy is a literal method everybody say a literal method and here's some advantages. One, it grounds interpretation in fact. It establishes itself on objective data, grammar, logic, word study. It exercises, number two, a control over interpretation that experimentation does for the scientific method. And, and look, there are individuals who build ministries just on end-time prophecy. You will get on the phone or get on the uh, computer or get on this or radio, and that's all they want to talk about. And yet, when people start saying, well, I believe that, that Putin is this or or." President Obama is this part of end time prophecy. You know, you got to be careful when you start pinpointing individuals. I can remember when Bill Clinton was the president, there were lots of folks calling him the Antichrist. But the Antichrist is a spirit. In Scripture, we find it identified as those that are not after Christ or those that do not follow Jesus. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're anti-Christ. And there are those that want to say, well, there's one individual who be anti-Christ. Anti-Christ to me is a spirit of the day that is going to be in total rebellion against God. And the governments, and we'll get into Daniel 70 weeks, and, and we'll see where the, the, the image, and, and I'm not wanting to get ahead of myself, way ahead of myself, but in the image... You, you saw the different significance, the gold and the silver and the brass and then the brass and clay. And each of those identify kingdoms, world powers that were established. And the brass and the clay is a mixture, very much like the world is today. Everybody say United Nations. So do I think that we're in that time frame? Yes, I do. Okay, Brother Bumgarner doesn't go around talking about prophecy a lot because there's a lot that we see vaguely. We, don't, we know where we're at and the signs of the time are all around us. We, we see it through a lot of the living, the lifestyle, the spirit of the world. But I am very careful to say that's a fact. In anything in the Word of God, as far as when people start saying, well, this scripture says so and so, so that makes it a fact. I kind of, in, in science, how many remember science class? Remember you learned about what? A theory. And what is a theory? Somebody's ideology about something. And if I have an ideology about something, the way to make it a fact is what? You prove it. And you prove it by, you know, doing uh, studies, doing tests, and, and, you, and you prove it by different methods. And you have to be able to show somebody where that is truth. And that's the thing about the Word of God, is I want to be able to show somebody where it is absolute truth. That's why I have no problem with repentance and baptism in Jesus' name. 
Because I can, through the Word of God, 100% prove that there is nowhere in the Word of God they baptized in the title Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but they obeyed what Jesus said, because Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And, of course, you church folks all know that we can go through the Word of God, or you should be able to go through the Word of God. And if you can't go through the Word of God, you need to get with pastor, and you can teach me Bible studies until you can do it. Because I want people to know that on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, and repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. I want to take them to where they went to Samaria, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus I want to take them there where Apollos, where Paul and the disciples of John were, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So that is something that we can prove. That's not a theory. That's not just a theological dissertation. That is a biblical doctrine that can be proven. Amen. And so we, we know that it comes to pass. Receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. We know that is a biblical truth. In fact, you know, we know on the day of Pentecost they received it. With the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Because people understood what they were saying when they were praising God. And then we know that at Cornelius' house, the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. And God had a reason for that. Because Peter had to make the statement. Well, hey, they got the Holy Ghost. Shouldn't they be baptized like we are? And they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so, in, in any scripture study, or anything that you're trying to make a doctrine in your life, and this has to do with convictions too. Now I could get off on convictions tonight, but you know, convictions are, sometimes God just gives you a conviction. That's your conviction. That is your personal conviction. And you need to live it. Amen. And yet there are convictions that pastor teaches. In the word of God. That are scriptural that we need to follow. And then there are some things that pastor teaches. Based off of principles to keep us from the world. Okay. And that is where obedience comes in. Hello. Hello. But at the same time, you know, there are certain areas where in you as an individual, God's going to give you a conviction. There are things that God's given me a conviction about that I don't preach in this pulpit to this church. He didn't give them to me for the church. He gave them to him for me. Now, the Lord tells me, hey, you need to share that conviction with somebody. I'll do it privately. And if I feel like God's want me to tell somebody they need to try that because it'll help them. Amen. Do you not realize that God gives us wisdom? Amen. And if people would use wisdom more often, we'd have a lot less trouble. Well, glory to God, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But you know what? We prove things. Prove them. And when we know that when we prove them, they come to pass. And when you're looking at prophecy, just be careful to to believe because you're going to hear all kinds of things come across their waves even in the united pentecostal church movement or, or other pentecostal churches there'll be people spouting things about the you know the the dragon and this and that and we we have i'm just telling you as a pastor be careful prove it this method is the only one constant with the nature of inspiration the holy ghost guided men into truth and away from error to do this, the Spirit of God used language with its meaning. So, you know, when you read something, take it for what it means. Don't try to put, put some extra curricular meaning to it. There are lots of individuals that want to take a word and, and they want to go into the Greek. And I do Greek studies and I, I do all, all those kind of studies. But you've got to be careful when you're trying to make a doctrine off a of typology from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And trying to make it fit into your prophetic way of thinking. Amen? I mean, when, 
when, when the Word of God says take away, the Word of God means take away. Somebody says, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. But there is that word take away, which means raptured. And that's where we get that terminology, that there will be a taking away. And we'll get into that. And yet, here's number four. It delivers us from both reason and mysticism as, a, as the determining factors to interpretation. We don't have to depend upon intellectual training or mystical perception, but rather upon the understanding of what is written in its generally accepted sense. So, you know, someone once said, you know, we're, a ration, we're not a rational people. We're a rationizing people. We're good at rationizing things, reasoning things. You know, so we have to be careful that we just don't, don't let just the reasoning, because you will always have ideologies coming in and, and, and thought processes and, and, and things of this nature and that nature. You know? It's like we don't want to reason consequences. I heard one of our, our, our presidential candidates today talking about abortion. And, and, and the person that was reasoning on the other side was, was, well, what about, uh, you know, these professional women that choose under the pressure to, to have an abortion? And he was talking about those that made bad decisions when they're younger and, you know, he wants to provide care for them. But here's the thing. Everybody thinks this that's ever got caught. It never happened to me. Huh? And actions, and I wish our young people were in here, but actions have consequences. And it doesn't take a lot of biology to teach us how reproduction takes place. And when you take it out of the confines of marriage and family, Hello. Then the only reason you don't want to have a child is because you don't want to have family. And it's really not a pressure situation. You made a bad decision to do something with the wrong person, and now you're going to suffer the consequences. So what is your choice to do in this day and age is I'll just abort the baby. Because I'm selfish. And self-centered. And it's all about me. Now I'm not trying to. But you know re that's how people reason. If you don't want to have to make those tough decisions. Don't make the dumb decisions. I wish people could hear me in this world. They need to hear this. Amen. I'm trying to teach my girls. Most guys, you can't trust them. You can't believe them. <laughs> Not when they're young. I tell my 19-year-old, I tell her, now, Sister Valerie, you behave over there. <laughs> I tell her, there's nothing like having a marriage that's right with God. And there's nothing like having a man that'll work hard for you and respect you and treat you right. And let me just say this, lady, there's nothing wrong with the ladies getting a good education and taking care of their family too. You work together. Whatever your dynamic is, you work together. Amen, that's truth. There was times in growing up when my mom stayed at home and there was times when she went to work because it's about taking care of the family. Amen. But I've told my daughter, if he don't have a job, don't bring him to my house. 
If he doesn't have a car, don't bring him to my house. If you're paying for dates, don't bring him to my house. Because I'm going to ask him one simple question. Now, I was born a bum, but what's your excuse? That's the good thing about having the name Bum Garner. You know, you can pull the old bum card out. And you know what? She should have expectations. She should never feel like she has to settle. But you know what? People reason things all the time, and they get themselves mixed up. Every woman probably thinks when she marries some guy, I'm going to change him. No, you're not. Somebody said, you know, that women think I'll change him, and the guy thinks I hope she doesn't change. And both things happen. Hello. Hey, but that's how people use reasoning. And we've got to be careful when you're trying to reason, you know, the Bible says seek out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It didn't say reason it out. It says seek it out. Because y'all, your, your logic is where the devil messes with your mind. And he gets individuals believing things that aren't, you know, things that are not evil to be evil and things that are evil that are okay. And then he allows mysticism. We've got to be careful of mysticism in this day and age. Palm reading. Those that deal in familiar spirits. Witchcraft. And you know, it's in our country today. Brother Shrek guys was telling the story about the man where the witch doctor was going to, you know, put frogs in him. And he laughs, you know how I see the frog didn't even make it to the front door of the church. And yet there are those that deal with the spirits of the world, the mysticism. And there's some the mysticism that can get caught up in the things of the church. Especially in old cultures, the Jewish cultures. We sometimes, you'll, you know, we'll mystify, make them magical. There's nothing magical about the spirit of God. It just is. And I almost forgot, but let me just show you how powerful God is. My mother posted on Facebook yesterday, uh, you know, she went to the cancer center and the doctors told her that her cancer's in total remission. And some folks would have given up after a year, some would have given up after five years, some would have given up after ten years, but she just kept trusting in God and, and you know, they said, we're going to keep you on some, uh, uh, one medicine just to just for our, for our good feeling. And, and, uh, and then they're going to give her something called Zamata or Zamota or something like that for her bone density. Because one thing that the chemo did over the years was it caused her bones to get real brittle. So they're going to give her some stuff. But they said, your, your cancer's in remission. She went to a service. Amen. She went to a service with Brother Stone King. And a man come up to her and said, the healing virtue of God's all over her. I'm going to pray for God to heal your cancer. She hadn't even told him that she had cancer. He began to rebuke the, the root of it and curse the root of it. And God touched her. That's what she believes. Amen. You know, God's able. But too many times, people just give up. I just put a little, I shared it with everybody. And, and then I put it, people wonder where I get my strong will and, and my sense of faith from. Any questions? Because she stayed faithful, folks. She praised God when she didn't feel like praising God. Amen. My wife got tickled because if she decided she was going to camp meeting, she called the cancer center and said, Look, I'm going to camp meeting next week. Just postpone my treatment another week. Because I'm going to church. If I die, I die. But I'm going to church. And I'm going to feel good when I go to church. <laughs> See, that's not mysticism. That's faith in action.